Hi, this is the video of Toot Ank Aten, known uh, to you as Tutankhamun. He ruled Egypt from 1334 BCE to 1325 BCE, so roughly about sort of nine years. Okay, the DNA scan, he had a CAT scan done on his body, identified that he died around about 23 years of age. So he came to the throne when he was 14 and he was assisted by a vizier called I. His mother was known as the younger lady who was found in KV35 and her DNA matches his as, as the mother. The father is a result of a body found in KV55 and it could be Akhenaten Amenhotep IV. Again, you have to remember that there was no writing on the mummified body. So it's just a DNA result which links him to Tutankhamun. Uh, so we can only speculate really that he is uh, Akhenaten. He married his half-sister, who was originally called Ankh Essen Aten. When they um, came to power, they both cha changed their names from the Aten cult to the Amun Ra cult. So originally Tutankhamun's name was Tut Ankh Aten, and then he became Tut Ankh Amun. And the same applied for his wife. She was known as Anka Essen Amun. His death is highly speculative. A CAT scan was done on his body in 2005 and it appears that he had a long term injury to his leg, which was an open wound. He was su suffering with several strains of malaria and he probably died of some kind of blood poisoning. When he came to power, the capital was moved from Memphis back to Wasset, who you know as Thebes and Luxor. Amun-Ra was re-established as King of the Gods at Karnak. With the move from Memphis back to Waset, the Amarna royal family who died in Amarna, who were originally buried in Amarna, were taken from Amarna to Memphis and then from Memphis to uh, Waset. And most of them were buried in the Valley of the Kings, probably in those unknown tombs. And then eventually they ended up in those caches that I men mentioned in earlier videos of uh, the King's Valley. Amenhotep II's tomb was used as a cache. The Delach uh, tomb was used as, as a cache. And that's, that's where they ended up. They have appeared to have been reburied from um, their trip from Memphis to Wasset to Wasset to the King's Valley. So just, just to bring you up to date, the younger lady, as she's known, which has a DNA match with Tutankhamun's mummified body, was found in KV35, which is Kings Valley 35. Other, um, or the body, which has a DNA match with uh, uh, Tutankhamun as the father, was found in KV55. So that's where it was buried or reburied and that's the um the body we are assuming is Arkadan, but it wasn't found with any writing on the wrappings or coffin that contained his name during tutankhamun's reign there were two uh, at least two campaigns the poor kushites they thought this was their uh, uh, chance for freedom the army was sent down to sort out the kushites and there seem to have been problems with Asiatics in uh, Canaan, uh, Amaru and the retinue. Relations between Mitanni and Egypt are reaffirmed. So there must have been a break in diplomatic relations between the two countries during the time of Akhenaten. What's interesting is the King of Mitanni didn't send a royal princess for Tutankhamun to marry. So you can see that they're not really uh, thinking that Egypt is a serious player at this time. So building projects during the reign of Tutankhamun, he built a Sphinx alleyway from the, uh, the gates of Karnak, going down to the Temple of Mut, 
and then the intention was to continue that alleyway all the way down to uh, uh, Luxor, Luxor Temple, um, the Southern Harem for the OPEC Festival. Work commenced on the ninth pylon and the infill used for the ninth pylon was going to be the Aten Temple. So they tore down the Aten Temple, which was in Karnak, and used it as an infill. Well, Tutankhamun died during the project, and the project was eventually finished by Horemheb, who then called it his pylon. So things could be usurped once you died. What's interesting is the 10th pylon, which Amenhotep III started, um, maybe it continued during the reign of Tutankhamun, um, because obviously Amenhotep III was his grandfather, but there's no indication that it was finished by Horemheb. During the uh, reign of Amenhotep III, who was Tutankhamun's grandfather, uh, the plan or the work commenced on the colonnade hall. And unfortunately, the king died. It was never finished by Amenhotep IV. Tutankhamun's reign, we see that that work is continued, but it was never finished during his reign. The tomb of Tutankhamun, KV62. So the king only ruled Egypt for nine years. Very short time indeed. Uh, the tomb was found by Howard Carter. His uh, patron was... George Herbert Carnarvon, Lord of Carnarvon. There was a seven year excavation in the Valley of the Kings to find the tomb of Tutankhamun. And before uh, uh, Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon had obtained the concession to the Valley of the Kings, it was excavated by Theodore Davis. And Theodore Davis had found um, a cache which um, contain some wrappings and things like that. And it wasn't really discovered uh, what this cache was until it went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and Herbert Winlock recognised that it was part of the embalming wrappings for a royal king. But Howard Carter had noticed this bundle and he knew that there was roughly uh, a raw tomb, probably intact or partially intact, close by. So that's what spurred Howard Carter to convince Lord Carnarvon to take on the concession of the Valley of the Kings. So they started excavating in 1915, uh, right the way up to 1922, when uh, the tomb was discovered. Now, Lord Carnarvon had had enough uh, after 1921, and Howard Carter said, Look, sir, I'm happy to pay for the next two seasons. So when uh, uh, Lord Carnarvon thought about it, he thought, OK, we'll carry on for another two seasons and then we're definitely going to call it a day. Because for him, it was costing him millions of pounds to exca excavate in our money today. KV62 is the smallest tomb in the Valley of the Kings for a royal king. It's more likely that the uh, the tomb that was going to be planned for Tutankhamun was actually in the Western Valley, not the Eastern Valley, KV-23. And that's where his successor, King I, was buried. Um, and remember that uh, uh, Tut Ankh Aten, as his original name, was originally from the Mana period, the heretic king, uh, maybe they thought it would be better if his tomb was cut in the West Valley. Because he died probably um, very, in very quick succession, his successor, I, had to bury him within 70 days. And again, there's a lot of speculation as to what happened. So in 70 days, if I was in that position where he was going to usurp the throne, um, he would have had to have changed the tomb art in some way when Tutankhamun was on his deathbed. It's believed that he went into the Valley of the Kings and he opened up relatives of uh, Tutankhamun and pulled out bits of furniture so that he could assemble some kind of uh, uh, burial uh, furniture for Tutankhamun. Because unless I 
buried Tutankhamun as the Sem priest, he could never become the king of Egypt. And that was his intention. The tomb contained over 5,398 objects. It took Howard Carter 10 years just to catalogue them, not to study them, just to catalogue them. So he had to go through the, uh, the uh, slow process of conservation. Now, a lot of these objects were made out of wood and he pioneered a way to preserve the wood because obviously when you've got gilled uh, gold gilt over the top of the wood the wood shrank inside and it created a cavity so what Howard Carter did was he drilled holes into the gold gilt and he filled up that cavity with a form of paraffin wax so the paraffin would soak into the wood and stabilize it and stop it from powdering and the wax would give it stability so it's not a case of taking out an object and writing down um for um red ferrari or uh, a bmw or whatever you had to take out these objects conserve them first they had to be photographed they had to be entered into an ascension register which was a register of fines and then they had to be transported packed up and transported safely from luxor to cairo museum howard carter had proved through archaeology uh, that the tomb had been robbed twice in minor ways um, in antiquity now, according to the uh, licensing conditions on the concession, if the tomb was robbed, the excavator had the rights to whatever was left behind. So that was written in law. Well, this was the most amazing partially intact tomb ever found of a royal king. And both Lord Carnarvon and Howard Carter agreed that all these are objects have been donated to the Egyptian people in their National Museum at Cairo. However, if there were any second objects, identical copies, then Lord Carnarvon had the right to uh, uh, transport them back to the UK. And there were several that he did. And when he died, that collection was offered by his uh, dear lady to the British Museum for this ridiculous small amount I think of like two thousand pounds and the British Museum said no it's too expensive so she sold the whole collection to the Metropolitan Museum of Art dear me now when I covered um, Amenhotep the fourth and Arkhanaten and the other video which I called Amana I never really talked uh, talked about the eternal life for the ancient Egyptian so I'm going to cover that now because um, Tutankhamun reverted back to the old ways. So let's see what he was changing from. According to the uh, Amana Eternal Life, which was written by Arkhanaten, in your tomb you had to have political scenes of Arkhanaten and his uh, chief wife and queen uh, Nefertiti. So you had to have those political scenes in your tomb. Then there was the divine order which had to be portrayed in your tomb. And that divine order was Arkhanaten, his wife Nefertiti and their children. So it was about family. If you fulfilled those two conditions, then you got the gift of eternal life from Arkhanaten himself. So he wasn't just... Uh, a king of Egypt who was also prophet and giver of life the promise of eternal life was in the hymns to Aten when Tutankhamun restored the old ways what the old ways was was the journey into the underworld so when an Egyptian spirit uh, left the body it then traveled into the underworld and it had to pass these tests these gateways and each gateways were protected by monsters, snakes, crocodiles, monsters, that sort of thing. You needed to travel on a boat if you could. It was safe. And if you had your shabti, your shabtis, laborers of burden to pull your boat through the underworld, that was even better. 
Once you got through those 10 gateways, you then had to pr prove yourself worthy in the halls of the two truths. And in the halls of the two truths were a set of scales. On one side of the scales was the feather of the goddess Mart, who represents truth and justice. On the other side, you placed your spiritual heart and your heart had to be lighter than the feather of truth and justice. If your heart was heavier than the feather of truth and tr justice, then the uh, uh, monster Anut would rush forward, <coughs> gobble up your heart and your eternal spirit would be die a second time. Or the heart could be picked up and thrown into a fiery lake and be destroyed again. And again, you would have a second death. And that would be it. That was your eternal life finished. So you can understand why the Egyptians were so keen to lead good lives if they possibly could. And then you would have to go before Osiris and make your co confession. And there were things in the confession that you had to promise you didn't do. You'd been good to cattle. You'd looked after your wife. You'd uh, uh, honoured your children, things like that. And if Osiris thought you were lying, it was a no-no. You couldn't go through the duet. If the Osiris, if Osiris believed you, then you could go through the ga gateway into the nighttime sky and you could visit the gods to worship the gods and to have your eternal life. But remember that eternal life is only available when it's nighttime because the um, because the afterlife is where the gods dwell and the gods are the nighttime stars. So when daytime came, the Egyptian spirits had to return from the afterlife back to Egypt. And that's why you needed your tomb, your uncorrupted body, which was mummified. So your spirit could go back inside the body and sleep inside the body until nighttime came. And then you went back to the afterlife to rejuvenate your spirit, to make it uh, fit to do that journey every night, you need provisions inside your tomb. So that's your update on what Tutankhamun reintroduced into ancient Egypt. So it was the old ways, the promise of afterlife. And it was an independent afterlife, which was given to the people of Egypt from the Middle Kingdom kings. It didn't rely on the king being the benefactor, the messenger to the gods. You had the right to go to the afterlife if you fulfilled those conditions. Under the Amarna experiment, that can only be done if you worshipped Arkhanaten and his family. If you couldn't prove that, no eternal life for you. Now, what's interesting about the Amarna uh, promise of afterlife is it's an empire theology. It's not uh, a theology which remains in Egypt, which remains in the borders of Egypt. It was based on Aten, and Aten is seen everywhere in the world. It was based on Aten in the West. That's where the eternal life would be, with Aten in the West. And in the hymn to Aten, Cush is named, Syria is named. So I think it was his intention to possibly, if there was a plague going on in Syria, Canaan and the Near East, I think his intention was to ride it out, don't send our soldiers there, OK, don't worry about these little incursions that are going on, that we're losing the Canaanite buffer zone. We'll let the plague pass and then we will invade those territories. We can then um, garrison those territories and we can then Egyptianize those territories because they had a device of eternal life to offer the conquered people, which with the old way, the journey through the underworld and um, the journey uh, in the two halls of truth, the confession to Osiris and the Duat, that relied on being in Egypt. You couldn't export Egypt somewhere else. The Duat was above Abydos.